We think you're going to love this lesson. We do because it looks at the subject of evolution from a different point of view. Instead of taking the usual route of interviewing experts who use big scientific words that are often difficult to understand, we interviewed everyday people who believe in evolution and let them put their foot in their own mouth. We took an orangutan to lunch to discuss the subject of acelids. We also called a number of airlines and asked if we could take a relative on the plane with us. Watch what evolves as we get into that subject. We hope you'll enjoy watching this as much as we enjoyed filming it. You've traveled to another dimension. A dimension not only of contradiction and speculation, but also one that defies logic and is based on blind faith. A journey into a nebulous land whose limits are that of imagination. You've just crossed over into the evolution zone. He can save the lost the way Jesus did. There's only a certain amount of time left. Time left. Time left. So use the law and use your testament to reach out to the lost. Reach out to the lost. There's nothing more important in your eternal salvation. What you're about to see was not planned. There was no script, there were no writers, there were no cameras, no production crew, no lighting, no graphic artists, and no editors. The entire program just happened. There was a big bang in our production studio. And here we are. Could you believe that? Of course you couldn't. Nobody in his right mind could, and yet many evolutionists would have us believe that in the name of science. There was no creator, no space, no energy, no matter. There was nothing. And then there was this big bang, and out came the sea and the land. And birds and flowers and trees and elephants and giraffes and horses and cats and dogs. And of course, man and woman. And this took countless millions of years. We're now going to look closely at some of the believers of the theory of evolution, and we want you to listen very closely to the type of language they use. True believers use what we call the language of speculation. They'll start off sounding like an expert, but because there's such a lack of factual evidence for the theory, they are forced to use words like, we surmise, we believe, perhaps, maybe, could've, and possibly. And then they'll end up saying things like, well, I really don't know, I'm not an expert, so watch for these phrases and for these words. So do you believe in the theory of evolution? I, th I do. Do you believe man evolved from apes? Yeah, because of biological evidence, I believe that. So do you think man evolved from apes? Yeah, I do believe man evolved from apes. Do you believe in the theory of evolution? Yes, definitely. Could you be specific about the evidence? Um how the planet Earth evolved from heavy particles and matter coming together and then slowly as it cooled off um, single cell life forms developed in the ocean and then slowly they evolved into multi-celled organisms and then eventually into humans. How did it begin? I don't know. Probably the Big Bang Theory. What caused the Big Bang? Probably an asteroid from another planet that had uh, had the same thing happen to it millions of years ago. Where did the other planet come from? I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. There's a lot of things. I mean, you look at, first of all, like homologous structures in animals and analogous structures and these things called vestigial organs. Um. So they come out of the sea? Um, yeah. Yeah, that's where they evolved because that's the only place that could support life. Okay. When they came out of the sea, was there air? Was there air? It took a while, but yeah, air eventually because of the breakdown of atoms and stuff and it was eventually released so yeah I think there was air when they came out because when they came out what came out of the ocean I don't know you tell me so do you think we were originally fish I mean it's possible did it come out as a dog probably not what was probably it? didn't come out as a mammal at all it probably came out as a reptile and evolved that way so you think we lived under the water it's possible at some point when we were under the water, do you think we had lungs or gills? Oof. <laughs> um. 
because I'm trying to think, here is this sort of animal who's coming out of the ocean without lungs, mm -hmm. so he comes out with gills, she goes, oh, 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 runs back to water and just keeps coming out until lungs mm -hmm. develop. Yeah. Wow. Now, this animal that came out <laughs> was in the sea, so it obviously had uh, gills. When it came up out of the land, did it have lungs onto um, the land? It, it could have either been amphibious or um, possibly even just had to evolve from having gills and not being able to survive without them. So you think we may have come from birds? It's possible. You know, it's really possible from anything. The first dog that came out, well it came up as a reptile, whatever it was, from an amoeba that was in the water that had gills and developed lungs and came up onto the land as a reptile, was it male or female? Probably unisex. So when did it and why did it change from asexual to bisexual, having male or female? Probably Probably when it, maybe from hydras or maybe some form of, you know, well, you know, meiosis, you know, like between a male and a female. So the first reptile that was under the sea as an amoeba, a million years, developed lungs <laughs> under the water, caught up on the land, was unisex? Probably. 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 I can't say for sure. Was it a male or female that came out of the change? It would be both, maybe a hermaphroditic. So, so do you think we could have evolved from horses? Sure. This animal that came out without lungs and breathed and went back in, was he male or female? Mmm, I don't know. He could, yeah. He could have been a hermaphrodite. He was male and female? Yeah, probably. And he was alone? I don't know, could have been. So he could have been alone? He could have been alone. So how did he reproduce? <clears throat> I don't know, asexually. He split in two? He could have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the this is the evidence that this this teacher gave you. His was a lot more in depth, but I don't remember it all. Sorry. Well, I really have no idea. I'm not an expert on that subject. But then you got to know that I'm not authoritative. You're not an authority on evolution. I'm a personal person. You know what I mean? Like, I, you know, with no major degree or anything. Do you think? Do you think God had anything to do with this? That's an area I have never explored, but. It's hard not to believe that sometimes. Okay, here's a simple lesson on evolution. The theory of evolution basically teaches that every living creature, like you and me, evolved from a single cell billions of years ago. So that means that every animal supposedly transformed into another kind of animal over time. Now, the big problem evolutionists have is that they're finding a huge gap in the fossil record. In other words, when archaeologists dig up the bones of these dead animals, they don't find these transitional forms that helped one animal transform into another animal. And if you don't have those bones, you can't prove evolution ever happened. That's what they're calling the missing link. And there's not just one, there would have to be thousands and thousands of those transitional forms. The truth is, they're not missing at all. They never existed in the first place. Now, maybe you're asking, what about the proof? I mean, what about those science teachers that showed us those drawings of apes all hunched over and then eventually straightening themselves up and becoming very manlike? Well, Remember, those are just drawings. That's not proof. The real proof is in what we can find in the fossil record, the bones that we dig up, and that's what's missing, the actual proof. In reality, this is what scientists actually have. Me and the monkey, apes and humans. The supposed transitional forms are what are known as the missing links. But the truth is, there is no missing link. There's nothing to link apes to human. The supposed transitional forms simply don't exist, except in the imagination of evolutionists who want to justify their theory. For instance, the amazing discovery of Lucy. But now, nearly all experts agree that Lucy was just the skeleton of a three-foot-tall chimpanzee or Nebraska Man, 
they created an entire skeleton with arms, legs, feet, hands, even facial features when all they really had was one tooth, which later was found to be the tooth of an extinct pig. Or Piltdown Man. The jawbone turned out to belong to a modern ape. And of course, Neanderthal Man, whose famous skeleton found in France over 50 years ago was that of an old man who suffered from arthritis. Hardly scientific proof. Listen to what the famous Harvard evolutionary biologist Stephen Jay Gould said about the fossil record. The extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil records persists as the trade secret of paleontology. Have you ever been mystified as to why human beings and apes have so many similar features? After all, compare our hands to the hands of apes. They're very similar, and our feet are a lot the same. In fact, we can make many of the same facial expressions and other things that apes can do. To prove this point, we hired an orangutan for the day and had some fun. Check this out. When I'm happy, my face goes something like this. When I'm embarrassed, if I don't agree, if I want to be nasty, if I've heard a bad joke, if I've heard enough, If I'm feeling affectionate, if I agree, does this prove that men evolved from apes? No, not at all. Think of it like this. Think of the biplane and the 747 jumbo jet. They're both very similar. After all, they both have wings, they both have landing gear, cockpits. Does that mean that the jet evolved from the little biplane? Not at all. It just means they have a common designer. The designer used a similar blueprint for each one. Same with us. God, the creator of the world and the universe, is our common designer. He simply used a similar blueprint when creating the hands and feet and facial expressions of men and apes. Despite the fact that there is no evidence when it comes to the theory of evolution, we're continually told that primates are our relatives. So we decided we'd have a little fun and call a number of airlines and ask if we could have a relative fly on the plane with us. U.S. Airways Office of Consumer Affairs, this is Ken. American Airlines, Nicole. Come on, Serenity, hello. This is our Chester, how can I help you? I'm flying with a friend, um, uh, and, and I'd like to take a relative with us. He works in the movie industry, so he'll have two managers with him, and the reason for the managers is he's a little slow intellectually. He's um, also got physical problems with underdeveloped feet. He can't stand upright. Uh, his name is Bam Bam. He's actually an orangutan, and what we want to do is take him on the flight with two managers. Is it possible to do that? No, sir. No, sir? No, sir. We can't transport animals on Southwest, sir. I mean, he's cute. Is that possible? I have to admit, I haven't been asked that before. I can certainly take a look into that. Uh, the only way that we would transport a primate would be in the cargo hold as air cargo. So you wouldn't let him in the cabin, even if he's a relative? That's a relative of whom? Of me, of human beings. That's what they teach in universities, that we're related to primates. Uh, <laughs> I understand <laughs> that, but primates aren't transported in the cabin. Is that possible? No, sir, it's not. Do you think we came from apes? Oh, sir, I wouldn't be able to get into that. that that's not something that I can discuss in a, in a work capacity, sir. Do you believe we come from apes? Sir, do you mind holding for just a second, please? You're not sure? One moment, sir. Thank you. He said, I've got a weirdo on the phone. No, sir, I don't wish to offer my personal opinion at this time. 
Despite the fact that airlines won't allow primates on planes for obvious reasons, there are some scientists who would have us believe that primates are just about as intelligent as human beings. So Kirk and I took an orangutan to lunch to see if it was true. Uh, a few salads would be great. A salad and some water maybe? Yeah, that'd be great. Um, Kirk salads. ordered lunch, he ordered salads, and you'll see this was a mistake in a moment. In this book called Evolution. Right at the beginning, the plant. ape began sucking our tracks. And I thought, well, he's got a taste for them, so look at him trying to steer me out. I was trying to put it in his mouth to keep him happy. Then he seemed happy to eat them. They're very tasteful. Here comes the salad. In came the lunch. Now, you notice they're salads, but I said to bring a plain salad for the orangutan and to put cheese and tomato on ours. And that caused Bam Bam to break the tenth commandment. He began to covet our lunch, because ours was obviously better than his. So I decided I'd give him my lunch. I sacrificed my lunch for this scene. And you can see he's quite happy with it. He's eating the cheese, he's eating the tomato. It's good, healthy food. Look at that. He's eating using a fork. Then he decided to go for Kirk's lunch. All etiquette was out the door. He just grabbed it from his plate and began stuffing his mouth like some beast, untrained. Now, it was around this point of time I thought to myself, this is not working. This is becoming a bit of a nightmare. I was actually impressed he was using a fork until he lifted it up like that. I thought I was going to get stabbed. So we decided we'd move all the food, the forks, the books, the tracks off the table and just have a plain tablecloth. He couldn't get up to mischief with a plain tablecloth, but look at what he does. He puts his hand under the tablecloth and then pulls it back like a tent. It was really like having lunch with Dennis the Menace on steroids. At this point in time, he decides he'll suck on the tablecloth. So we decided we'd finish the scene and look, he's still sucking on the tablecloth. My dream turned into a nightmare. The incident reinforced the fact that the primate is limited when it comes to the unique ability, the human ability to reason, to invent, to appreciate the sound of music. You see, you don't get orangutans forming themselves into an orchestra. You don't get them forming themselves into a court system to mete out justice to its fellow creatures. This isn't because he's a prehistoric man who is less evolved than us, but it's because he's another species. The revered father of evolution, the man who really made the theory popular, is Charles Darwin. He wrote Origin of Species and the Descent of Man. Ladies, listen to what he had to say about women. The chief distinction in the intellectual powers of the two sexes is shown by man attaining to a higher eminence in whatever he takes up than women can attain, whether requiring deep thought, reason, or imagination, or merely the use of the senses and hands. Did you hear that? He's saying that man has evolved to a higher eminence over women in basically anything he decides to do, whether it requires reason, imagination, or deep thought. Darwinian evolution, at its core, is not only male chauvinistic, but it's also very racist. Charles Darwin wants us to believe that black people are less evolved than whites. If we can't convince you of how unscientific the theory of evolution is, perhaps these following experts can. Ernest Chain, Nobel Prize winner, said in reference to the theory of evolution, I would rather believe in fairies than in such wild speculation. Sir Arthur Keith, the physical anthropologist and anatomist who wrote the foreword to Darwin's Origin of the Species 100th Anniversary Edition, said, Evolution is unproved and unprovable. We believe it only because the only alternative is special creation, and that is unthinkable. Malcolm Muggeridge, British journalist and philosopher, said, I myself am convinced 
that the theory of evolution, especially the extent to which it's been applied, will be one of the great jokes in history books of the future. A wise man once said, man will believe anything as long as it's not in the Bible. Unfortunately, that is so true. Can you give me an, any example of a transitional form, going from one kind of an animal to another kind? Uh, transitional form between one and another? Well, the thing is, it already is an animal, whatever it is. You mean like saying one that's halfway between this and this animal? Right. Uh, can't think of anything right off the moment. The parrot that's on your arm, God created. How could, any, how could science make a parrot? Science, nature made it. Nature made itself? Yes, absolutely. So made the parrot? Evolution. So evolution made it? Mm -hmm. So you don't believe God created things? Well, I don't know what you're referring to as God. The creator. To me, evolution, nature, is God. When it comes to evolution, what was the scientific fact that convinced you that it was right? Um, I would say how it all got started, like explaining how we have elements that were brought to earth by, you know, like would say meteorites or whatever that it all got started in the ocean and um, organisms grew and, you know, people evolved from there. Believe in the Bible? Uh, yes, I do. So you believe in Adam and Eve? Yes, I do. <laughs> so, was Adam used to be an ape? No. Did he crawl up out of slime? No. <laughs> so which way are you going to go? Did God create man in his image and tell him to bring forth after his own kind or did he begin as some slime from a meteorite from outer space? <laughs> Non-random changes that come about as a result of selection, okay? Who's doing the selecting? Selecting is being done by the ecosystem. And where it's did this come by, from? It's being done by predators. Where did it's it come from? It's being done by geological processes. Well, here, this is the big question. This is where atheists and theists both have a problem, okay? And I'm going to admit to it, okay? The problem we have is at the beginning. The problem we have is at the beginning. The problem we have is at the beginning. Here's a very interesting fact. In the last couple of dozen times that I've witnessed to someone, I can honestly say that the subject of evolution has not come up even once. Why? Because I didn't bring it up. I didn't have to. And it doesn't come up on its own because it's often a non-issue. When you learn how to speak to a person's conscience and circumnavigate the intellect, the subject of evolution seems to disappear. Now this is real good news for people like me. It means I don't have to become an expert in the fossil record. And it also means I don't have to learn words like rhino rondothacosaurus. Now, are we trying to be anti-intellectual or avoid talking about the subject of evolution? Of course not. That's why we have the Evidence Bible. And this is packed full of teaching on the subject and includes quotes from teachings from Charles Darwin, Stephen Jay Gould, and William Huxley. And it will show you that the theory of evolution is unscientific, that it's based on blind faith, so that you don't need to panic and upset yourself every time you read in the newspaper or see something on the news that talks about man evolving from apes. You can have confidence in God's word that we are made in God's image. And true science, even our common sense, supports the Bible and not the theory of evolution. Let's look at the church and ask, what is the purpose of the church on earth? While well, we're here primarily to glorify God and to lead lost sinners to the Savior. We know there's going to be a day of judgment and we have to present every man and every woman perfect before a perfect God and a perfect law they must face on judgment day. We want them to put on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved from the wrath that's to come. Let's look at an analogy that's going to make a very important point. Let's say you're on an airplane and you're trying to convince another passenger to put on a parachute because you know at any moment he's going to have to jump 25,000 feet out of the plane. You have two lines of reasoning. The first is you try to convince him that the plane was made by Boeing. Now, this is important because it will give credibility to the emergency card which will tell him about the parachute. So, 
you point out the fact that the, the maker's name is written all over the plane. He doesn't buy it. He thinks the plane happened by accident. Then you tell him that it's a relatively new plane. He thinks it's an old plane. You say you have proof, so does he. And as long as you disagree, he ignores the emergency card and you find yourself in a frustrating and perilous situation. The second line of reasoning is much easier. All you do is you tell him about the law of gravity and you say what it will do to him if he jumps 25,000 feet on his frail body. His eyes widen with fear and he says, hey, would you pass me that emergency card thing? I want to check it out. Now, you and I want to convince sinners to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We can talk to them about God and His existence. We can talk to them about the age of the earth and how old it is or how young it is. And this leads to all sorts of discussions which often end in arguments. Or we can tell him about the jump, that he has to pass through the door of death and face a holy God and a holy law, whether he believes in God or not, on the day of judgment. We show him the Ten Commandments which stir the conscience and bring the knowledge of sin. He realizes his danger and sees his need to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you believe in the theory of evolution? Yeah. Why? Because we all had to come from somewhere now. So where do you think we came from? Be s to me, I don't know. You don't know? They say apes. <laughs> what do you think? You said you believe that. Well, science proved it, so just... What science has proved it? Yeah. You believe them? It's been proven, so I guess what they teach us in school. So what do they teach you in school? What convinced you evolution was true? Tell you the truth, I slept all through that <laughs> Oh no. It's <laughs> <laughs> interesting. I slept all through that class. Have you had any Christian background at all? Uh, yeah, I was Methodist and my stepdad's Roman Catholic, so. It's sort of a bit it's murky like, in the background. Yeah. So would you consider yourself to be a good person? I think I'm a good person. But well, who does it now? Say. It's true, all of us think we're good people. Yeah. Should we do a little test to see if you are a good person? Let's go for it. I'm gonna ask you three or four questions. All right, man. You ready? Yeah. Have you ever told a lie? Oh, yeah. What does that make you? A liar. Have you ever used God's name in vain? I've been known to do it. So that's called blasphemy. It's a very serious sin. And Jesus said, whoever looks upon a woman and lusts after her has committed adultery already with her in his heart. Have you ever looked at a woman with lust? Well, yeah, I ain't gonna lie to you, I've done it before. So, listen to this, Corey. By your own admission, you're a lying, blasphemous, adulterer at heart. Yeah. So if God judges you by the Ten Commandments on the Day of Judgment, do you think you'd be innocent or guilty? I'd probably be guilty. Will you go to heaven or hell? If there is, I'd probably be going to hell. Does that concern you? I mean, it does, but I'm not gonna concern myself with the stuff right now when I'm trying to live my life. I'm still young, so I could, like, God always says that you can't be forgiven, so. You sure about that? I'm pretty sure. It's in the Bible somewhere. Corey, when do you think you'll die? Hopefully when I'm old and decrepit, you know. Have you ever walked through a graveyard and looked at the ages people die at on tombstones? Yeah. They die young, don't they? How old are you? I'm 18. I wonder how many people die at 18. Quite a few, huh? Yeah. A lot of car accidents at 18. Some people have weak hearts they don't know about and they just drop dead playing football in the heat. Mm -hmm. Everyone thinks they're going to grow to be old. So you better think about getting right with God right now when you're 18 because I tell you what, as you get older and your skin becomes harder, so will your heart or your attitude towards God. Mm -hmm. So the Bible says this, remember your creator in the days of your youth because you're soft and tender of heart. And as you get older, you'll become hardened and uh, and, and life might deal some hard things towards you get bitter and get bitter at God. And so while you're young and tender, yield your life to the Lord and say, God, I've sinned against you. You know what God did so you wouldn't have to go to hell? Do you know what he did for you? Hmm? Do you know what God did for you so you wouldn't have to go to hell? Died on the cross. You know that. Do you understand what happened on the cross? Not really. What he was doing was being punished for your sins. He was paying the fine for the law that you'd broken so that you could leave the courtroom. So because Jesus suffered for you, took your punishment, that means on judgment day you can go free from God's justice. But you must repent and trust in the Savior. You've got to turn from your sins. The Bible says because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you can have eternal life. As an 18-year-old, you can pass from death to life if you'll yield your life. Jesus said, he that seeks to save his life will lose it. 
but he that loses his life for my sake shall save it. In other words, if you give up and say, God, I surrender, take my life. You know, I give it back to you. You gave me life in the first place. God says, that's the way you're going to save your life. So you've got to humble yourself and yield yourself to the Lord. You realize you've sinned against God? Yes, sir. You know he's angry at you for your sins? He probably is. Are you prepared to repent and trust the Savior? Yeah, on Sundays I might. Sundays? Yeah. I don't know. I gotta, no, I gotta live my life. I'm only 18. Okay, tell me what you want to do that you can't do if you're a Christian. Try and tell me without feeling embarrassed. I don't know. I'm usually, I'm a free spirit, so I'll go out and do anything. Yeah, but tell me what. See, if you gave your life to Christ tonight, what couldn't you do that you want to do? What is it that's stopping you coming to Christ tonight? I don't know. I can tell you. Nothing, I guess. Sin. You want to go out and fornicate. Oh, yeah. See? Yeah. And is it worth it? What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? The most precious thing you've got is your life. Would you sell an eye for a million dollars? Both for 20 million. Nah. 50 million. Nah. See, your, your eyes are precious to you, yet they're just the windows of your soul. How much must your life be worth? And you're saying, ah, oh, I'm going to risk my life. I don't care if I lose it. And fear God. You know, realize that you can't spurn the Lord and turn your back on Him and spit on His mercy. Imagine if God lost patience with you and said, okay, Corey, tonight your soul is required of you. I've spoken to you enough. And God killed you tonight. You say, He wouldn't do that. He killed two men in Genesis. I think it's chapter 36, because he didn't like what they did sexually. He killed the husband and wife in the book of Acts in the New Testament because they told one lie. And Jesus told of a man who said, I've got so many goods, I just want to build bigger barns. And God said to him, you fool, tonight your soul is required of you. So man, think about what we're talking about. This is your eternal salvation. Eternal. So you've got to weigh up which is better, the excitement and pleasures of sin for a season or everlasting life. I'd say the second choice. Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my words and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Congratulations. You have successfully completed the Way of the Master Intermediate Training Course. We hope that you've not only found this fun and enjoyable, but also very helpful and practical. If the intermediate course left you saying, I want more, well, we've created the advanced training course for you. In it, we'll explore the teachings of Islam, Hinduism, Judaism, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness, New Age, and others. We'll help you to understand what they believe and equip you to lead them to the only true God. Thank you for obeying the Great Commission to seek and save that which is lost. There is no higher calling. Thank you for joining us for the Intermediate Training Course. Be sure to visit us at our website at wayofthemaster.com where you'll find more information about the Way of the Master ministry, including updates about our next exciting series called The Advanced Training Course.